always a sacred thing uh, when you gather for worship, no matter the time of year or the circumstances that are, uh, are happening, whether it's a, a summer Sabbath, uh, whether it's a small group uh, up at camp or whatever is happening, wherever we gather and, and whenever we gather in the Lord's name, it, it is something that brings smiles to our Heavenly Father and brings joy to heaven. Um, so I'm always grateful. It's a, it's a strange thing to be gone from church for two weeks, even though technically I was at church up at camp meeting, but it's different. It's good to be back in this church. Would you pray with me? God, uh, we are uh, still learning so much about your greatness, about your glory, about your plan for our lives. And Lord, we still have much to learn, but uh, we know that you are with us today. We know that you want to reveal yourself to us again once more. As we get closer to the sharing of the Lord's table, Father, uh, continue to reveal yourself to us. And may we be blessed by knowing that we have worshiped with you and that we have worshiped you today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I'm not using any uh, uh, slides. My, my comments here will be brief. Let 45 minutes at the most. That's brief. Uh, our main purpose is to fellowship together in the observance of the communion service. But as we draw closer to that, I do want to share uh, a, a thought. And it is related a little bit to Father's Day, as you can see by the title. But I want to share uh, just, a, I think, a, a little bit of an anecdote. Uh, when some heard the title of my sermon, they were uh, worried, maybe is the word. Uh, they, this was their comment. That's rude. <laughs> uh, did you get a bulletin? See, Drew, you're not. Wh where are we today, Drew? Come on. Who's your daddy? <laughs> now, I realize that's a bit edgy. That can be used in our, our culture in a very derogatory way, in a, in a very aggressive way. And I, I was a teenager once. I, I know how people will use that phrase. I, I want to see if we can be mature, though, and disassociate ourselves from the negative connotations and try to analyze it from a little bit of a different perspective. Now, when I was younger, it's not like this is a new phenomenon either, either. When I was younger, the, the phraseology was slightly different. When, when I was a child, especially boys, now I know girls are competitive too, but boy and girl competition sometimes manifests its way in different ways. Boys usually are a little bit more physical, a little more aggressive. And so uh, as a little boy, you would say things like, well, I got more toys than you. And, and the retort would be, well, I'm better at video games than you. And then you'd say, oh, yeah, well, my t-ball team is better than your t-ball team. Well, my house is big. You, you know what I'm talking about. You guys don't know anything of what I'm talking about? Your, your boys never did this, Bill, never competed in any way. But if that little tit for tat goes on long enough, eventually it's going to come to, well, my daddy can beat up your daddy. You know it's true. It, 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 I don't know where that comes from. Maybe, maybe I'm slightly unique in that, but I think for many of us uh, in our adolescence, you know, maybe not uh, older children, but when you're little, there, there is this idea that my dad is powerful and my dad is, I'm going to use my dad as leverage to show that, that I'm also powerful because my daddy can beat up your daddy. So that was kind of uh, when I was small, before, before the verbiage kind of evolved to uh, and take on a slightly different connotation of, well, who's your daddy? But again, I want to I wanna try to look at this from a, a, a different perspective, not just the uh, pejorative or the derogatory. In a way, if you just look at it in a, in a microcosm, the, the whole question of who is our father is, is a significant uh, spiritual element of the entire biblical narrative. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when the father comes to his children after the fall, and they don't come to him, they hide, he asks a question. We all know that question. Where are you? 
right? Where are you? This was unusual in the Garden of Eden. God had communed with Adam and Eve before. They had had a relationship, but this was unusual. In the cool of the day after sin, they run from him. And in a way, in a way, I'm, I, Vince, forgive me, I'm making a little bit of a connection that I hope you can uh, follow me with. In a way, the question was, what has happened to our relationship? What has happened? Why are you hiding? Why do I not see you? Have you chosen another allegiance? Am I no longer your God? Who's your daddy? Okay? You go all the way through the biblical narrative, and you can see this identity of, of, of do we know who our God is? Do we know? Even right into the Lord's Prayer, which I've preached on before, but I still like to uh, uh, emphasize the, the, the significance of the invitation when Jesus instructs His disciples how to pray. The first words that Jesus instructs us are we are to address God as our Father, not our sovereign God, not the invisible, immortal. Now, He's all those things. He's the Creator. He's the Redeemer. But the first reference to God when we pray to Him is to acknowledge Him as our Father so that Jesus doesn't have to, or the Father doesn't have to say, where are you? We are making that connection again. You're our Father. Going all the way to the book of Revelation, where in the Laodicean church, and we, we talk about this a lot in the church, but the Lord says, I stand at the door and knock, right? He's saying, in the last days, I'm going to be outside of your experience, and I want to come in. I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice, so he's not just knocking, he's calling. And what do you think he's saying? What do you think he's saying? He's saying, where are you? Why am I on the outside? I want to come back into intimate relationship with you. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. And we shall abide together. It's that invitation again to intimacy that was lost at the fall, and the question of God from beginning right through the biblical narrative to the end can be in some way asked, well, who is your daddy? Who is your father? In that connection, I want to draw your attention to one of the most famous chapters in all the Bible, Psalm 23. We're going to look at Psalm 23, and I'm going to point out something maybe you've never noticed before. It's a wonderful, poetic, elaborately structured, very brief. It's only six short verses. Many songs and art, uh, you know, art and everything have been dedicated to, to, this, uh, to the shepherd's psalm, as it's called. Psalm 23, okay? Many of you know this by heart, or you, you might know most of it by heart, but if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 23. It's called the shepherd's psalm. But it doesn't end with the analogy of a shepherd. Much of it does have to do with the shepherd-sheep relationship and acknowledging the protection and provision of God on our behalf. But it does not end with God as our shepherd. And that's the transition I want us to look at today as we prepare for the Lord's table. You know the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And of course, this is written by David, who was himself a shepherd and, and valued the lessons that could be learned from that, that vocation and what God would instruct him. Many of the biblical characters were shepherds. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I shall not want. I'm not going to be in any need. He makes me lie down in those green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. All this shepherd metaphor of, of having the grass and the waters and, and the, the provision and the leading down the paths of righteousness, all those beautiful ana analogies. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So again, more shepherd analogies there. The shepherd with his staff that would ward away the wolves, ward away the predators, but also had that hook on it to pull that wandering sheep back to that righteous path. You might not like that hook at times, but you understood that the Father in His discipline and love would pull you back to righteousness and bring you back to that path where you would have success and provision. But after that verse, the analogy changes. 
And I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but I invite you to look at it and, and consider it this morning. Verse 5, so after your rod and your staff comfort me, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The metaphor has shifted. Sheep don't eat at tables, right? And sheep don't have enemies. They have predators, okay? Yeah, they have, you know, things that prey on them. But the, the verbiage and the imagery and the, uh, the, 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 the analogy has shifted. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My, uh, uh, you have anointed my head with oil. She, we don't anoint sheep. Sheep were never anointed. The analogy has shifted from the shepherd, no, no longer just a shepherd. He's now a king. He's now a provider. He is now a father preparing and providing for his children. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not talking about sheep anymore. Living in the Father's house. You can imagine when Jesus was telling his disciples in John 14, um, um, uh, my, in my Father's house are many mansions or many rooms. I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again that you may be with me and we're going to be with each other forever. You can imagine the disciples may have thought of Psalm 23 at that point because Psalm 23 gave the promise that we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And here's Jesus saying, I'm going to that house to prepare a place for you. We're not talking about sheep anymore. We're talking about children living with a father, okay? So the shepherd's psalm, while starting out as that analogy of the shepherd and the sheep and all the values and lessons we can learn from there, doesn't stop. Our relationship with God does not stop at us being sheep and him being a shepherd. It needs to progress beyond that to him being a God and our father. But I want you to consider exactly what David says here in verse 5, he mentions three things. Three things. First, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What does that mean? Well, if you've been in this church longer, you've heard me talk about this, uh, this element before. You've heard me say it before. The eating together in the ancient culture, and not just in the ancient culture, but in our culture, is a symbol of intimacy. We don't just eat with anybody. When you go to Taco Bell and you get your order, your big tray, okay, do you go next to some stranger that's sitting down and just push over in the booth and sit next to him and say, hi, I'm going to join you. Do you do that? Now, I know some people do <laughs> because they're being stinkers. And I know in some cultures that is not altogether unusual, and especially if it's a very busy where you have limited. But if there's a dozen places to sit, do you sit with a stranger? No. You sit with your family. You sit with your friends. You sit with those who you know. When you were first dating or when you are, are getting ready to date, okay, one of the first things you do to explore that relationship is eat together. You might start with ice cream. See how that goes? Maybe that'll extend to a latte the next date. But by the third date, you're probably going to Taco Bell. Then you know the relationship is really going well. What do you do to get to know someone? You eat, and then you invite them to your house to meet the family, the parents if you're younger, right? To meet dad, and then you get to have that higher level of intimacy as you eat together with the family. This is not altogether you know, different in our culture than it was in their culture. The idea of eating with someone showed familiarity, intimacy. So when David, the author of the psalm, says, in the presence of my enemies, my God comes down and he sets a table and he prepares it and he invites me to eat at that table in the presence of my enemies. Do, do you understand the visibility of what he's saying here? He's saying that anyone who wants... Now, no, by the way, does David know a little, a little bit about enemies? Did, did, has David struggled with enemies in his story? 
Okay, from the time we first read of David, he's fighting giants. He's got the Moabites attacking. He's, he's, he's got the Philistines all over the place. Even in his own home, he's got Absalom turning against him. He's got counselors and generals. He's got enemies his whole life. He's fighting. That's why God wouldn't allow him to build the temple. God said, I love you, David. You've done great things from Israel, but you've got blood on your hands. You've been a warrior all your life. I want the person to build the temple to be a man of peace. Let Solomon, your son, he's going to build that temple that will last forever. So Solomon builds the temple because David had been faced with enemies his whole life. So David says, my God puts a table and prepares the table in the presence of my enemies. So when I sit down at that table, I am declaring to all the world that I have intimacy and I have a relationship with the God of heaven. Do you still want to be my enemy? Imagine the scene. David fighting Goliath. The Philistines on one side. The Israelites on the other. And before the great battle between David and Goliath, he says, now wait a minute, I'm hungry. And my father has prepared a table. And God, in his power, remember, the God of the Old Testament is not the gentle Jesus that we like to so relate with. When God reveals himself in the Old Testament, it, not in every case, but in most cases, it's a, it's a powerful experience. It's a thundercloud. It is a, a, a mountain shaking. It is a pillar of fire, right? Most of the visibility that we see of, of the manifestation of God in the Old Testament, we're, you know, we're not talking about little stuff. So imagine that, that pillar of fire coming down in between the Philistines and the Israelites. And God, that, that invisible hand, like the hand that wrote in, in, in the book of Daniel, that wrote on the wall, that invisible hand coming out of the pillar of fire, right? And coming to the table and picking a plate up and putting it on David's side. And then God preparing that meal. And David, thank you, Father, and eating that. Can you imagine what that would have looked like to the Philistines? Now, wait a minute. This guy has got that God on his side? This is the type of thing that David is saying when he says, you prepare a table before me. When God is on our side, it is a declaration that he is our father. When we eat from his table, it is a declaration to the enemies of God that he's our father, that he's on our side. Now, David knew that, and that gave him the confidence during his life whether or not that visible manifestation was taking place. But God makes this declaration, and, and, and part of his provision, part of his protection, as he says, we have intimacy together, we eat together. And it's only because of his provision. Notice it says, he prepares a table for me. Okay? We're not contributing to this. He has done the provision. It's by his act, by his sacrifice, by his work, that the table is ready for us to partake of. It is his sacrifice that makes it possible for us, us to come to the table. And when we do come to the table, it is a testimony to the enemies of God and to any who would object that our God is our Father. He goes on to say, you anoint my head with oil. Now we often assume or, or imagine the anointing process as, you know, for prophets and kings, priests were anointed with oil. But on a daily basis, uh, in the Jewish culture and in many in the ancient Near East culture, you would put oil on your head as a symbol that you are accepting the provision of God. Oil was a symbol of the blessings and joy of God. Oil was very valuable, especially the oil used for anointing. It was the first pressing of the oil, the EVOO oil, okay, the extra virgin olive oil. By taking it and putting it on your head, said, God has provided for me. I can do this without fearing of lack. You say, well, what a waste of oil. And by the way, it was usually more than just a little dab on the forehead. It was usually a quantity that they would put on their head. Um, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, when, when giving instructions about prayer and fasting and things like that, he says, when you fast, don't put on an ugly face. <laughs> he actually says that. Don't put on an ugly face. He says, wash your face and anoint your head with oil. 
showing that even though you're fasting, you're still living in the abundance and the blessing and the joy of your Father who's in heaven. When Jesus is in Simon's house, just before his crucifixion, and Mary comes and anoints his feet, if you remember that story, and all the people say, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this, this was that is touching him. And Jesus says, Simon, let me tell you something. When I came into your house, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with perfume. Jesus is again illustrating that in that custom, when you anointed your head with oil, it was a way of showing welcome, invitation, blessing, joy. And in David's analogy here in Psalm 23, he says, when I come to the Father's table in the presence of my enemies, not only does he prepare that table before me, but he also anoints my head with oil, with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the promise of the provision and blessings of God, with the protection of God, he puts it on my body, he shows who I belong to. When he anoints my head with oil. And then the last uh, part of verse 5, he says, My cup is overflowing, or in the King James, runneth over. My cup runneth over. Yep. Toby, I have two volunteers and one indentured servant. They're going to come up and help me with an illustration. So Peter, Jaden, and Toby. Come on up here. <laughs> Don't be so excited about it. Calm down. Look at them how they're just kind of sauntering up. You can see how, how much I had to twist their arms for this. Come on up here. I told you you wouldn't have to say anything. Now, I need you to stand. Yep, right here. No, okay, I need you over here. All right. Fine-looking young men, aren't they? You know, Jaden, I, I really appreciate you, and I value you. I think you're a good guy, and you, you kind of look thirsty. Let me give you a little. There you go. What a blessing. Yeah. Hey, Peter, it's been so good get, getting to know you. I, I think you're a good guy. Can I, can I offer you something to drink? Okay, here you go. Boy, enjoy. Okay. No, don't, don't drink yet. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Ugh. Hey, hold that. Look at this, yeah? Uh-huh. Now, hey, uh, is this Toby? Man, I'm so good to see. Are you having a good day? Are you, are you enjoying the day? Isn't God blessing you on this Sabbath? You know, it's always so good to have you in church. I'm always blessed when I see you here. What an em- enormous blessing. Okay, did you notice a difference? Did you notice anything different about how I shared my cup with these young men? Now, these are good guys. I love these guys. I want them to be blessed. This guy right here, powerful. Peter's my man. I I want him to be well, well well-fed and and, and have his his thirst quenched. But what did I do different about him? You know, there, there's a difference between me and this guy and, and me and these guys. Which one's my son? How many of you don't know me? I see some guests here. Yeah, do, do you know which one's my son? Could you tell? It's this one. This one. His cup was filled to overflowing. Can you, can you say thank you for my volunteers for coming up here? You guys can go down. Yeah, take it. It's my gift to you. It's my gift to you. Oh, I, I love it. It's, it's, an, it's a powerful image. David says, when I sit down at God's table, not only does he do it in the presence of my enemies to know that I have intimacy with the Father in heaven, not only does he anoint me with oil, showing that his love and his protection, his provision is always with me, and the power of the Holy Spirit covers my entire being, But he takes my cup and he shows his abundant blessing by pouring into it. And and it sounds wasteful, doesn't it? It sounds, by the way, I used water. I I was thinking about using something that had color, but, you know, staining and all that. But anyway, so uh, God says, I have so much to pour into his life, he can't even contain it. I'm going to keep pouring it because it's overflowing, because that's the abundance of my love that I have for him. That's why the end of the psalm, David says, surely goodness 
and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. If that's the type of relationship I have with God, where He invites me into intimacy, He anoints me with the Holy Spirit, He fills my life with goodness and abundance and overflowing, if that's the type of life God has for me, then surely goodness and mercy, there's no doubt about it, are going to follow me and be with me, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. It's not some sub-housing unit down the street, God says we are going to live in his home with him because we are his sons and we are his daughters. And whenever we come to the Lord's table, we are declaring to the enemies that he is our father. We are proclaiming the provision of God. We are accepting the anointing of the Holy Spirit and we are receiving the mercy of God's forgiveness and power, not just to a cup that is filled, but to a cup that is overflowing. Can you say amen?